my name is Chris Jackson. As, as mentioned, I'm the uh, uh, president and CEO of Cicero Diagnostics. So uh, we've been around for about eight years now in the fertility space. And our focus is on exactly what you see on the screen there, unexplained infertility. And uh, we launched this test to help women uh, with answers in their most difficult uh, times, whether they are struggling to get pregnant or to uh, stay pregnant. Uh, we're of the firm belief that unexplained fertility is not really a diagnosis. It's just a cry for more information uh, for various situations. And uh, we think we have some great information to share with you today. Uh, I'm going to cover some of the, the basics about uh, the test and uh, what its current status is, what test results mean, how the sample's collected, all that kind of good information. And uh, then more than happy to answer any specific questions that uh, may come up as a result of the conversation here. So these were the seven main questions that I think will provide a great foundation. So I'll go over each one of these in a little bit more detail. If you don't remember anything I talk about today, just think of BCL6 as I put in the box there. It's this unwanted house guest that shows up every month with the worst possible timing. So what the heck does that mean? Well, that means uh, there, there are certain inflammatory conditions uh, that your body produces inflammatory proteins to go fight off infection, to go do this, uh, to, to help the body. Uh, BCL6 is a protein that can be found in, in, in various body, uh, sites of your body. Uh, some of you might have known BCL6 uh, in lymphoma testing, for example. It's a marker of inflammation there for, uh, in lymphoma and certain malignancies. Uh, when we find BCL6 in the uh, endometrial lining, though, um, that is a, a reaction to the, uh, the by the body's immune system to endometriosis somewhere that we hadn't uh, assumed or, or knew that we had. And so BCL6 is a protein that you don't want to have show up on the uh, uterine lining. And that's what we we're finding in a lot of women that were struggling either becoming pregnant or staying pregnant is that this protein was showing up once a month like this unwanted house guest. And it's kind of wreaking havoc on your ability to be able to get pregnant or uh, stay pregnant. Now we all have BCL6 floating around in our, in our body, but when we have it in large amounts, especially in the uterine lining, it's gonna kind of challenge the process of being able to get pregnant either naturally or if you're going through uh, IVF. So if it's there, uh, as you can see, uh, we, we have problems with uh, becoming pregnant or staying pregnant. So what's the test all about? What's it doing? So we're detecting inflammation and that's the receptiva test. When you hear receptiva, that's what we're measuring. We're measuring the BCL6 protein. And we're detecting that on the uterine lining during the window of implantation, which is you know seven to 10 days after you ovulate. That's the most likely time that uh, you would conceive. It's the most likely time that they would do an embryo transfer via IVF. And so what we're doing is instead of doing any of that stuff, we are taking a biopsy of the uterine lining at that time and seeing if the BCL6 protein is, is present. So um, if you want to think of it in, a, uh, uh, in a, an imagery kind of way, think of a beautiful garden and you've got this great soil, but all of a sudden when you're going to plant, there's this white film on top of it uh, and it's just messing things up and it's not allowing the seed to implant or to grow. And statistically, when we've done our data, we've shown that women that have BCL6 uh, that test positive for it, you're five times less likely to get pregnant than someone who tested negative. So really important information. It's information you, you would love to have in advance if you could, or if you've gone through IVF or something like that and have failed a few times, you know, maybe this is something you want to try and detect before you kind of keep going on and uh, assuming maybe a different result is going to happen. So when should you do it? Or I'm sorry, who, who should be a candidate for testing? Uh, this is kind of the general guidelines. Every doctor develops their own uh, routine on how they, they'll bring up the test. In the fertility world, uh, most of the people that are uh, considering testing have some type of history of, of, of transfer failures. Uh, we're not exactly promoting this as an upfront test because we know that women that have endometriosis uh, still can get pregnant, but there are a good few, about 40 to 50% that are challenged by the result of their endometriosis and they can't get pregnant. 
So anybody with a history of IVF failure, a history of uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, which is uh, defined in the US as two or more, I think in Europe it's three or more uh, pregnancy losses. Uh, also is the, the same thing, BCL6 is kind of wreaking havoc. Uh, women that may, maybe haven't gone through IVF yet, but they're very low on embryos. They only have a few uh, embryos available. They might want to do the test uh, up front. Uh, other women that are doing the test up front are, are, are folks that maybe don't have the uh, the insurance coverage, the funds, the patients uh, to go through multiple rounds of IVF. And so the kind of a kitchen sink approach, let's, let's do everything up front. Uh, if you're not considering IVF, uh, the definition of, of doing our test generally falls in with the, de the definition of what they call unexplained infertility, which is if you're under 35, 12 months of trying naturally without success, six months uh, without success if you're over 35. And then, of course, women that have experienced multiple first trimester pregnancy losses. You can't get through that first important uh, 12 to 13 weeks. So just kind of as a, a review as to what's going on, you know, every month your body's doing this miraculous thing about getting ready for a potential embryo, right? Your endometrial lining is building up. It's enriching it. It's ready for an embryo at any time. And, uh, you know, if you... Uh, Obviously, you're not trying to get pregnant. You know, it sheds off and you have your period. Uh, but what the uterine lining doing is thickening, getting ready for this uh, embryo to implant. What, em what endometriosis uh, does, and let's just talk about endometriosis uh, first. Endometriosis is uterine tissue that has somehow left the uterine cavity. And that could be back through the ovaries, out into the body, or in other means. But... Uh, little pieces of tissue from the endometrial lining have found their way outside of the uterus and have attached elsewhere in the body. And it could be the most common areas are the pelvic area, um, uh, the ovaries it can attach to. And these are just, these are implants and they just stick and they're there. Well, the body treats them like endometrial tissue like that's on the uterine lining. And so every month when you're getting about to get your period, as the endometrial lining is thickening, these also inflame. And depending on where they're located, they can cause excruciating pain for a lot of women. And that's kind of the definition of uh, a lot of endometriosis, people having uh, uh, painful intercourse, painful bowel movements, all these uh, just abdominal pain, just excessive pain right before the period. These are like hallmark signs of endometriosis. In fertility, a lot of women don't have any other signs or symptoms of endometriosis other than their fertility issues. And so even though they're not experiencing other symptoms, what's happening is the body is sending an inflammatory response to, these, to this endometriosis, but it's sending it to the uterine lining and it's sending it in the form of BCL-6. So that's why this BCL-6 protein shouldn't be there, but is showing up in a lot of these women. And so what we found is that a good 50 to 60% of women will be positive for BCL-6 if they've been going through fertility and haven't uh, even considered endometriosis as a possibility. It's actually the BCL-6 that's getting involved there and just creating this unlevel playing surface. So in addition to blocking an embryo from being able to plant, implant, it also can dislodge an embryo that has made its way to implanting but it's uh, messing things up and not allowing the pregnancy to continue. And one of the things that it does is BCL-6 interferes with this really important hormone progesterone. So we think of progesterone as one of the main ingredients in birth control pills, and that's what progesterone's doing. It's telling the body, hey, we're pregnant, even though you're not. But progesterone does a couple things. It takes over for estrogen and it nourishes the embryo uh, during that critical time period, but it's also signaling to the rest of the body. Hey, we're pregnant. Don't have any periods We're, we're trying to protect this do not attack this as a foreign object Well, BCL 6 is getting involved and it's disrupting progesterone from doing those two important jobs And when it does that it allows for a miscarriage to happen And that's where a lot of miscarriages if they're not attributed to genetic abnormalities are most likely caused by this BCL-6 protein, this unwanted gas that's just getting in there and uh, wreaking havoc. So here we go. The receptiva test, just to, to, to uh, kind of review here, it's measuring the amount of BCL-6 protein on the uterine lining. 
So how do we do that? We do that through an endometrial biopsy. I wish I could tell you there was a blood sample or saliva test that we could do it on, but right now we need to know what's going on on the uterine lining, and that's why we do this endometrial biopsy. And when do we do it? So if you're in a natural cycle, seven to 10 days after ovulation, you have one of the ovulation kits, you, uh, for example, test positive on a Monday for your LH surge, your biopsy window opens up the following Monday for four days, seven to 10 days after ovulation. Some of you may be seeing a fertility doctor and they're controlling your cycle. They're giving you a trigger shot. They're giving you progesterone. You're taking progesterone daily. What they'll do is they'll give you the shot and then they'll start the progesterone and then they'll take the biopsy six to 10 days after uh, that trigger shot. And what they're doing is instead of doing the transfer, they're taking uh, the biopsy at the time they would have done the transfer to see what the uterine lining's condition is uh, right at that moment. So they do that. It is a, a, an uncomfortable procedure. I'm a guy, so it's very difficult for me to articulate that, I think, for anyone to truly appreciate it. But uh, there's discomfort for about five to 10 seconds, maybe some light cramping for about 10 minutes or so afterwards. But then you're able to resume your uh, regular day. It's done during a routine office visit, too. So it's, it's up to you on how you want to go about scheduling your day around that. Um, the biopsy is sent to our labs. So we have two labs in the United States. They're uh, put in formalin, so they're really stable for shipping. We use DHL to get them across the uh, the pond or across the Pacific, uh, and um, they're in our labs uh, within a very short time period. And we say it takes 14 days. Uh, by the time it gets to our lab, it usually only takes about seven to 10 days, uh, but we need time for the doctors to get the results and interpret those too. So we always tell uh, women should expect results in about uh, 14 days. Cost of the test is $690 US. That not only includes that BCL6 test I was telling you about, but it covers all the shipping costs and everything. It covers the cost of us shipping the kit to you or to your doctor's office and everything. But it also includes a full pathology report. You have pathologists looking at the samples so they'll look out and they'll rule out anything, just like anything, anytime you go to the doctor and have something removed, whether it's surgery or skin biopsy, uh, they're looking for everything. They're going to rule out cancer. They're going to rule out uh, dysplasia, all these things. Good information to have. Uh, very, very rare. We I think we found two cancers in 25,000 samples, but you're getting a full path report too. So if there's anything noted, uh, you're also getting that information. But the most important thing is the BCL6 result we're trying to get pregnant here, right? Uh, that's the most important thing everyone wants to see. So who can do the test? Uh, any fertility center is, is able to do this and uh, they do these uh, routinely. We have about 400 sites here in the US. Uh, in Europe, we're, we really haven't focused too much on this. We probably have about 20 different locations in Europe that uh, are doing the biopsy right now. But the truth is anybody can do that. We'll send the kits out to, to uh, uh, the fertility center that you're working with. Uh, if you're not working with first, uh, Fertility Center, uh, your uh, GYN office also uh, can uh, do this collection. They may not be as experienced, so you might want to just find out if they're comfortable in doing that or if they can refer you to somebody that they prefer to have uh, uh, it done. But most of them uh, do these, maybe not as routinely as a Fertility Center, but they, they, they do perform them. Uh, you can go on our website. You can see... Uh, uh, who's doing the test uh, in, in your area. If we're doing some of that really just means that they uh, have our kits on hand and have been offering the test for, for some time now. And uh, the kits we send out at no charge uh, in advance to you. We just need some advance notice to get them out into your hands. And then finally there, uh, uh, I know you're dying to have another app on your phone these days, but the, uh, we do have a Receptiva app. And it's just great. It covers everything, soup the nuts on the uh, uh, biopsy, what results mean, uh, everything about collection, treatments, and, and all that good stuff. So uh, if you get a chance, it's, it's absolutely free. It's a great talking tool to speak with your uh, clinicians, providers, and everything uh, if they're looking for more information on the test as well. Great script uh, for you to bring it up. Okay, so what happens if you're positive for the test? Well, let me first start off if you're negative for the test and uh, about 30 to uh, you know 40 percent of women will test negative uh, that means you we've ruled out the uterine lining as a is as an issue so that's good news maybe not great news if you're searching for answers still but we've eliminated one of the potential causes 
Uh, depending on your IVF failure history, for example, uh, uh, our, our data that we've done so far, uh, it's about a 75% likelihood if you've got two or more failures that you'll test positive for uh, Receptiva, the BCL6. So what are the two treatment options? These, there are a number of treatment options that are coming out, but these are the two I can actually speak to because there are published data behind them. Uh, the first is laparoscopy. It's always been there, and that's a surgical procedure uh, that they uh, use. They go in with the scope uh, and two devices, so not only can they scope it, but they can also remove the lesions or any implants that they find. So that's a, a treatment option that has been there for a long, long time, obviously. The issue is not everybody has coverage for laparoscopy. Here in the U.S., for example, uh, insurance is not covering it unless you're in extreme pain, fight for all your uh, rights to, uh, to have it covered, but generally it's not covered and it can be a very expensive procedure here in the U.S. It may be more readily available depending on uh, what country you reside in and your healthcare system. What's happened over the last five years is that there's an advent of hormone suppression therapy. So you'll hear that term, you'll hear the term Depo-Lupron uh, as, as one of the medications that's uh, used. And Depo-Lupron is uh, one of the uh, medications that suppresses your uh, your, your system. It basically puts you in a menopausal state for uh, however length of time you do these. In the case of what we did in our studies, we did uh, two injections. You came in, you did an injection for 30 days, uh, and then came back in, had a second in injection for another 30 days. So this takes you away from having a period, gives you a glimpse of what your future life will be later on in life, because uh, you're you're not going through your cycle. It's it's stopped everything. So it's suppressing estrogen and progesterone from doing their job and you doing your regular cycle. And the reason for that is that estrogen is the culprit. Estrogen is what inflames those implants I was telling you about that inflames everything. It's it's feeding that. So while it's building up your, your endometrial lining, which is good, it's also feeding those endometriosis implants, which is bad because now it's generating that inflammatory response. So it's doing all this temporarily. But what we found is if you do this for the 60 days, for example, in the IVF setting, and then you go right into a frozen embryo transfer cycle, success rates are really, really good. They are we're talking two out of three women, in some cases 75% are seeing success on the very first transfer after treatment. And that's that's just great news for women that were just frustrated, had no previous pathways or anything like that. So it's not treating anything long-term. It, it, it is doing this long enough for you to do two things, get pregnant and stay pregnant, which is what you're looking for here. Surgery is the only way that you would actually get rid of something long term. So you got to think of endometriosis as something you'd have to treat eventually or it's going to rear its ugly head again. So for fertility, uh, uh, women going through fertility treatments, hormone suppression therapy is great. It's achieving your goal. It's getting you pregnant and keeping you pregnant. But if you're suffering from a lot of those symptoms I was talking about that are true lifestyle impacting systems, then you, you really may want to consider laparoscopy because those are lifestyle issues that you definitely want to consider as a treatment. But I'm not a doctor. It's really up to you in a conversation you would have with your doctor to uh, uh, figure out what the best path is on that. But for, for women that are going through unexplained infertility and failed IVF transfers, failed IUIs, uh, this is providing answers and a new pathway for a lot of women that didn't have that opportunity before. And we're very excited here in the U.S. because a lot of the data that we've got back, not only what we publish, but now we have about 4,000 data points from various fertility centers that report back to us. They're getting the same, if not better, success rates. So it's, it's really amazing because a lot of these women were ready to give up. They had uh, just gone through all kinds of financial um emotional, physical, all these things with the effort of trying to get pregnant and all of a sudden they come upon our test. And so now our test is being used up front and or at least after one or two failures and being discussed earlier on. And it's giving a lot of women this new treatment pathway for the first time. It's very exciting. Great question. Uh, the reality is, is that if someone already has endometriosis or previous diagnosis of endometriosis, this test wasn't designed for them. Uh, if, if they've gone through treatment, it's been a few years, they can do the test. 
Uh, but this test was born out of the need for what's going on with these women that have no other explanation for their infertility. They uh, might have even gone to the extent of having their embryos genetically tested. So they're only using, you know, the grade A, the best embryos, and they're still not getting pregnant. So you have to consider that this is another uh, uh, part of the equation. It's not the only one. Obviously, the quality of the embryo matters, but uh, we consider the uterine lining the soil and what's going on with the soil. And that's why BCL6 is so important. Uh, the, unless there were what we call products of conception from the miscarriage that they can analyze, uh, we, we really don't know. So a lot of times uh, uh, they'll be able, if they can get some of the material and do genetic testing on it, they can find out. You know, nature has a way, obviously, of, of identifying there's certain uh, genetic diseases that are not compatible with life. And so the body actually will take care of that on its own. Uh, the reality is, is we don't we don't know. They they believe in all the data that about 50% of all miscarriages are a result of a, a genetic issue, and so that's the most common. Um, for women that do know because they had their uh, embryo screened or what have you, uh, that actually does not um, uh, apply, and so women are looking for uh, more answers. So what we're really focused on with a lot of our research is that. Uh, that uh, going back to that thing about the progesterone not being able to do its job. And there's a condition called progesterone resistance. And we're just now kind of understanding how do we help this process so we can keep, you know, if you if you think this might be the issue with the BCL-6, how do we fight progesterone resistance? And so we're looking at some various treatment options uh, that they're looking at in some research right now, uh, looking at synthetic progesterones to aid uh, that maybe would be less, um, uh, have less issues with the BCL6 protein wreaking havoc. So uh, exciting stuff, uh, especially for women that are, uh, you know, it's difficult enough not to get pregnant. It's, it's it just as much, if not more, the emotional and, and physicality of, of going through a miscarriage. Yes, uh, we have a lot of support for the offices when they first start because it's new information for them. Uh, and it's also very difficult for them because they're so used to like, well, let's just try again with IVF. And uh, sometimes that's a bit frustrating for a lot of the women because they want answers. They, they're, you know, there's sometimes uh, with all due respect to the fertility industry, there's not as much compassion going on when someone goes through a, a loss and the clinic can't help it. They're in a business mode and the first thing they say is, well, call us when you get your next period and we'll start again. No compassion, no, oh my gosh, how are you doing? And and that is that their job? Well, that's debatable, I guess. Some, some centers are obviously uh, better than others. Uh, so what we're doing is preparing them with the information on uh, how to work with the patients and what to expect. And part of that is the app. Uh, the app is not only for uh, women to learn more about our tests, but providers are using the app kind of as a script because it's all right there in the palm of their hand as well. Okay, you're 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 positive. We're going to do uh, this or that. This the second sheet of our uh, result page is a static page that has all the information on on statistics and everything. So they really have great talking points uh, with their patient when they're reviewing the results with them for the first time. Well, let's make sure we understand the BCL6 is an inflammation that's caused by those implants. So what the doctor would be doing in surgery would be looking for lesions or implants uh, somewhere else in the body and removing those. And by doing that, that reduces the inflammation on the uterine lining, which is the BCL6 uh, that we're, we're measuring. So uh, she doesn't need to have our test. She's already ahead of the game by having laparoscopy. Most women don't have that uh, advantage. You know, 25 years ago, everyone was having laparoscopy as a, a general workup, and uh, they would find endometriosis all the time, but uh, they don't now. But uh, in, the, in this case, she's ahead of the game, and uh, there wouldn't be a need for our test. Uh, the only thing I can uh, tell people is that uh, uh, and I, I do this in the U.S. when I talk to patients, and it's not meant to promote our test a, at all. But uh, in, in fertility, uh, your hands should be on the steering wheel. And I think as much information as you possibly can have uh, is power and knowledge. And I know doctors are busy, and you have that 
very few precious minutes with the doctor and everything. So do your homework, uh, be ready to talk with them, but don't be afraid to ask about these things uh, and, 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 and bring those up. And the other thing is that if you are challenged by the whole situation, I can tell you that there are so many support groups out there that are in the same boat as you, that fertility is a, uh, uh, a, a an issue, a challenge for so many people, and it's been a difficult thing to share, but there's so many groups out there, whether it's pregnancy loss or failed implantation. That's how a lot of people found out about our test, and I owe it to the, the women that have been out there promoting our tests that have had the success stories and everything. So. Uh, just be proactive. Uh, you, you might help someone else down the road as well. 